This is a, this is a contribution by myself and by Alexis Ulutku. And I just want to thank Jean-Jacques Hublin for the invitation, the Collège de France and the Musée de l'Homme for the, um, the support of this meeting to pay tribute to, uh, to Yves Carpens, who I will talk a little about at the end. This, um, this is really addressed to the people in the back of the room. Um, on the top here are living organisms. On the left is time. And those lines and the numbers are the best guesses of the common ancestors, of the timing of the common ancestors of modern humans and chimpanzees and bonobos, and modern humans and chimps and bonobos and gorillas and orangutans. And those best guesses come from the molecular differences. They don't come from the fossil record. The, a lot of what you've been hearing, and especially from Johannes yesterday, is really what's happening in this period between seven million years and three million years. And these are hominins, and it's clear that not all the taxa that you have, that you have heard about in the last um, day or so, they can't all be ancestral to modern humans. And so we have in our fossil record a mixture of close relatives like your aunt, and ancestors like your parents or grandparents. And the question is, which are the ancestors and which are the close relatives? And so um, you could argue whether Australopithecus is an ancestor or a close relative. I'm not going to get into that because I want to get out of here alive. Um, so, um, so the fossils could be on any of those lines. There is no reason why the fossil record has to contain ancestors or close relatives of living taxa. They can also contain the, um, the they can also contain evidence of clades which have no living representative. And what I can't sometimes understand is the reluctance to think that you might have discovered something as interesting as a creature which is more closely related to modern humans than chimps and bonobos. That would really be interesting. It would also be interesting to, to if you discover taxa that are, that are, they're on the chimpanzee line, but they are not direct ancestors of modern chimpanzees and bonobos. That would also be really interesting. When Eve was born, these were the taxa that were known in the hominin fossil record. There was Australopithecus africanus, from Africa and Homo rhodesiensis from Africa. We need to remind ourselves just how little was known not all that long ago. And I just want to say I'm, I'm today's representative of what Jean-Jacques referred to as the old people on his left. And my guess is that uh, the two other speakers in this session, if you added up their ages, they would probably come to less than my age. So I'm the, uh, the representative of the ancien regime. So this is the fossil record. This is a rather specious interpretation of the fossil record um, today. And I've highlighted Australopithecus Afri um, I've highlighted, highlighted Australopithecus afarensis because that is the star of the show. Most of the discussion you've heard um, relates to taxa 
that might either be ancestral to Australopithecus afarensis or might be the descendants of Australopithecus afarensis. I want to talk about some taxa over here, which may well be the descendants, but which I really hope that nobody in this room thinks are ancestral to modern humans. Because if they do, they're in the wrong business. These are creatures that are really derived. They have no equivalent. They have no living equivalent. If you want to try and, try and understand what they were eating or how, or how they were moving around, you have to go and look at pandas or something like that or extinct lemurs. They had no modern equivalent. And the one I want to start with is Paranthropus boisei. And I just want to introduce you to Paranthropus boisei. You heard, um, you heard a lot about Paranthropus boisei yesterday from Sandrine. And what you have to realize is that the people, uh, the paleoanthropologists who are interested in Paranthropus boisei could probably accom be accommodated in the elevator that takes you upstairs. There aren't many of us, okay, because it's not an ancestor, it's weird, and that's why I like it. Um, the, the story started at Olderby Gorge, and, um, and there is a picture of Olderby Gorge. Olderby Gorge is the sort of poster child for a fossil site. It just makes sense. You can see all the layers and if you were a child like, like me, because I have a strange jaw, I spent most of my childhood in a dentist's waiting room. And in the dentist's waiting room, there were copies of the National Geographic magazine. And the National Geographic magazine had pictures of Alderby Gorge. And Alderby Gorge was being investigated by Mary and Lewis Leakey uh, since the 1930s. 30s, they knew there were stone artifacts. They were looking for the hominin that made them. In 1955, they found this strange, large molar. Lewis Leakey had many attributes, but he wasn't a great morphologist. And he thought this was one sort of molar, and John Robinson wrote in Nature and and corrected him. But basically, there was this large molar. Was it a milk tooth or was it a permanent tooth? Did it come from the upper jaw? Did it come from the lower jaw? Um, they really didn't know what to make of this, and it wasn't what they were expecting. They were expecting something different. And then in 1959, Mary Leakey saw some, uh, some, some hominin fragments and she realized that they belonged to, to a cranium. She discovered them. He published it. Okay, this was the, 19, this was the late 1950s. Um, and uh, what Mary Leakey discovered was the cranium here, which became the type specimen of what they called Zinjanthropus boidii. Zinj because it was the Swahili for East Africa, and because um, they thought it was a hominin, and so the ending anthropus as, as opposed to the, uh, the pithecus, which is the ending that Raymond Dart used. Um, why Boisei? That's an interesting story that if you buy me a drink, I can spend an hour explaining to you. It's after this man, who is Charles Boys, who gave the Leakeys money. Charles Boys was an economic geologist who made a lot of money from uh, from um, 
mining diamonds or working for a company, eventually worked for Anglo-American. He was, he came from North Dakota, so one of his hobbies was curling. And he lived in London, and the nearest place that you could go to curl was Switzerland. And he was in Switzerland when he read a copy of the Times newspaper where there was a letter from Lewis Leakey. And the letter from Lewis Leakey said, uh, these awful Americans are going to come to, to Kenya and they're going to come with all their money and their expeditions and they are going to uh, move in on what we're trying to do in Western Kenya. So if you are irritated about something and you, and you come from the English speaking world, you write to the Times. And, you, and so he wrote to the Times. And, and Charles Boys read the letter and thought, this is really unfortunate. So he wrote to Lewis Leakey and said, I think that's really unfortunate. Maybe I can help you. How can I help you? Lewis Leakey, as usual, said, send money. And so Charles Boys sent money, which allowed them to go to, to Western Kenya, where they found a skull, um, which was um, the skull of Proconsul Africanus. And so within about two months of giving them money, Charles Boys was in London, Mary Leakey brought the skull to London, and that was a pretty rapid return on your investment. And so Charles Boys gave them more money, which allowed them to work at Olduvai Gorge. So as a way of saying thank you, they called their new fossil Zinjanthropus boisei. I could explain all the images, but I won't. Um, he was a bit of a philanderer, and that's his wife. You don't need me to interpret the look that she's giving him. So that was 1959, and in 1964, Richard Leakey and Glenn Isaac went to Lake Natron, and where Kamoya Kimu discovered this mandible. So for four years, Zinjanthropus boisei had a brief but very glittering career as the only maker of the old Doan culture. But then in 1964, as Sandrine explained, the Leakeys by then had discovered a hominin that they thought was much more likely to be the maker of the artifacts. So, so Paranthropus boisei was relegated, but as you heard from Sandrine, it's recently been rehabilitated as a possible maker of the old German artifacts. So what about Pithecanthropus Ethiopicus? And that brings me to Eve Coppens. Because when they were working in the Omo, um, they discovered a mandible which was unlike the mandibles of Zinjanthropus boisei that had been recovered. And Yves Carpens and Camilla Arenburg wrote this paper in the South African Journal of Science where they pointed out the differences between this mandible and the mandibles of, of Zinjanthropus that became either Australopithecus or Paranthropus boisei. So now if we think about the Takana Basin as a whole, not just Omo, not just Kubifora, but the whole area, what we know is that, uh, that Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis are represented in the fossil record. And Paranthropus ethiopicus and Paranthropus boisei, I've put now Paranthropus ethiopicus as the ancestor of Paranthropus boisei. You will note, or rather, could I ask the people in the audience, what's missing from this diagram? There are lots of columns, but what's missing? 
There are no lines, okay? There are no hypotheses about what's ancestral to what because I really largely don't know, okay? I really respect people who think they know, but I don't know, okay? But I don't know. So, so for about a million years, early Homo, whether it's one species or two, and Paranthropus, whether it's one species or two, they were both in the Chicana Basin. Now, I'm not saying they, you know, would have queued up in the checkout line at the same monopri. Um, you know, we don't know the extent to which they interacted, but they were certainly there together in the Chicana Basin. And the conventional wisdom is that when they were together in the Chicana Basin, okay, um, Homo, early Homo, Homo habilis evolved into early African Homo erectus that was a lot smarter than Paranthropus boisei. And because they were a lot smarter than Paranthropus boisei, it essentially sort of drove Paranthropus boisei towards the margins and eventually to extinction. That's the conventional wisdom. And that is a form of competition which is called um, um, character displacement. And this is what Alexis is working on for her PhD. You will. The people in the front row will be relieved that she's my last PhD student, okay? So, so my possibility of infecting young people is, is, no longer, is no longer available. So that's the conventional wisdom. Don't forget, conventional wisdom was called by C.H. Waddington, who was an embryologist. Um, he referred to the conventional wisdom of the dominant group which he called cow dung. Okay, that was his acronym for the conventional wisdom of the dominant group. So that's the conventional wisdom. However, a long time ago, we looked at the evidence, uh, the dental evidence for um, um, Paranthropus boisei, and there wasn't any change during that million years, which was not consistent with character displacement. So, so what Alexis is doing is that she is exploring a different form of competition, which is called ecological niche incumbency, and I won't attempt the French version. And basically what this would mean is that the lineage, which includes Paranthropus ethiopicus and Paranthropus boisei, was the incumbent. They were the game in town. And there is quite good evidence that those large tooth forms may go back to between three and four million years. I'm not at liberty to tell you what the evidence is, but there's quite good evidence. And so they were there. And so Homo were the incomers. And the Paranthropus said, okay, fine but we're not going anywhere. <laughs> you know, we've been here a long time, and a million years is 750,000 years more, or maybe 600,000 years more than Homo sapiens has been around. So to call Paranthropus boisei somehow not successful is clearly crazy, because whatever it was doing, it managed to last at least a million years. And so the prediction of niche incumbency would be that not much happens in, in Paranthropus boisei, but it sort of pushed Homo to explore environments that it wouldn't otherwise explore. So although Paranthropus boisei is not an ancestor of Homo, it may well have influenced the evolution of Homo. 
And that's what Alexis is exploring. She is, um, she's in Nairobi at the moment. Uh, there is a much bigger sample of teeth. We need to see whether it, there is still no change through time in Paranthropus boisei. And, and I look forward to her results um, in the next year or so. Which, which brings me to Eve Coppant. I first met Eve in 1968. Richard Leakey called me Woody. And so whenever I saw Eve, he would say, hello, Woody Woodpecker. Hello, Woody Woodpecker. He was a lovely man. He was just a lovely man. He was a kind man. He was a smart man. Um, he was a gentleman. He was a good scientist. And because he wasn't scheming, he was sort of, you know, maybe, you know, wasn't as good as, no, he was a good scientist. And so it gives me enormous pleasure to be part of the, of the celebration of his life. Thank you. <laughs>